Hey guys, and welcome back to episode 31. And now for something a little bit different. This week we have with me, of course, my normal co-host, Mike the Wildebeest. Mike, how you doing, buddy? Hey guys, good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Well, welcome back, my friend. It's good to see your face again, as usual. Um, as well, guys, we are very honored and proud to have a special guest this week. We have our good buddy, Jose, or otherwise known as Cupcake to some, from the wonderful podcast, Watch Skip Plus. So we want to give a big, warm welcome to Jose. How you doing, Jose? Yeah. Welcome to the pod. Or I'm doing good. Channel. Yes, good thank you. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is certainly different being on video um, yeah. and, and yeah, realizing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a different experience, right? For sure. It's funny oh yeah. You, it's funny you mentioned that because I obviously heard the the gentleman's guide to Midnight Cinema episode that you were on last week, and uh, of course we appreciate it the plug for appearing on here. And then of course at the end of that I heard Will to, uh, breaking out of or Sam excuse me breaking out of his shell about possibly showing up on the show at some point. And, oh uh, good, yeah. Yeah, me and Mike were just joking around because he doesn't make you know he he doesn't get a, he doesn't get out there with a you know with a lot of pictures or anything like that. So we'll, we, we were joking around. It'd be nice to see his, his face, you know, for once, you know, more. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but anyway, it, we're, we're so excited to have you on board today for the episode. And today, guys, before I forget, because of course the most important thing is we're going to be talking about Ken Russell's 1971 film, The Devils, um, which I think will lead to an interesting conversation. Um, before we do that, how about you tell us about yourself, Jose? Uh, what are your, tell us about your podcast, yourself, I don't know, maybe some of your favorite films, your influences, so our audience can kind of get to know you a little better. If that's Yeah, right. abs absolutely. So uh, I co-host Watch Skip Plus, and so we are a movie review podcast as well. Uh, we talk about new streaming or theatrical movies, which is kind of like a high wire act if you think about it because mm -hmm. the movie gets released not a lot of people are really talking about it or critics maybe haven't talked about it and so again it's you know there's not much to reference and you're kind of going on a high wire and talking about your own opinion as you've seen it um mm -hmm. and the the plus from our title comes from the fact that we do like a lifestyle review before uh, mm -hmm. So each of the hosts will have, um, you know, something that they just tried or listened to or watched or an article of clothing. It can really be anything, a play that they saw. And so it's a, a nice way to sort of break the ice and get to know the hosts in some ways as they review something different from a movie. Um, although sometimes it's it is just reviewing another movie or a film and then getting into the the review itself. So uh, we started in 2022, August of 2022. My uh, other co-host read Justin, the cinemasochist, unfortunately had to step away. So we had in, have a new co-host, Alex MC, starting in January of this year. So it's sort of like our chapter two. Um, and then just a little bit about me. I grew up, in the 80s, this movie was released three years before I was born. So um, I grew up in the 80s and again, just a child of HBO and cable. And that's where I Absolutely. saw all of my horror films and, you know, 80s action films. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up in high school discovering world cinema. So like Almodovar and Peter Greenaway and then just kind of started exploring the world of film from there. Awesome, man, awesome. Well, you know, you, you, we're like we discussed before off camera, we're the same age. So, so like yourself, I come from that same point of view. I didn't discover world cinema probably until I was in my late teens. And even then mm. I, was a little, I was a little unresponsive to it at first just because I was an ignorant idiot from a small town where, what do you mean movie with subtitles? You want me to read, you know, like I had that, that perspective so i definitely can completely understand where you're coming from and your background so it's awesome man well i can say i can speak for myself i go to your podcast every week because you guys besides having the plus aspect which i think is awesome because you've enlightened me with some really cool products and ideas 
what I love about your podcast is you guys talk about stuff that's playing in theaters. And a lot of the podcasts that we've listened to in our community just don't really do that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's great because I actually definitely respect and love your opinion as well as Alex. You guys each have your own fresh take on things and it's an interesting discussion. Um, so you guys do a lot of hard work because you're seeing stuff in the theaters and it might be hit or miss. You might walk out of it and be like, oh my God, or it might be the next masterpiece. And I, I got to give you guys a lot of credit. That's, that's really awesome. So yeah, I got to give you guys props too. You know, that I've been a cheerleader since the beginning, probably. Yeah. Episode one bullet train, I think. And then I've been a fan and been a big, and uh, you've been on, (laughs) I have, I've guessed it, but I've been a loud choir boy. And a big part of the reason why I even did this is because I got addicted to it, guesting with you. And we had like, two or three weeks in a row where it was really fun. And then right after I got done guesting, John posts something saying, Hey, I'm looking for a co-host if anyone's interested. And I quickly was like, hi, John, remember me? We've met like eight (laughs) years ago. I'm the Kringle. (laughs) So again, I think we all come from the gentleman's guide to midnight cinema. And I think we all kind of listen to similar stuff. And I think we all kind of poach from each other's listeners. Um, But I, uh, from the beginning, your podcast is unique because a, I love that it's that you are very that first off the first iteration was basically a bi guy and a gay guy talking about everything they loved all the crushes that they had and it's a very unique perspective that in our community and in a lot of film community you don't hear and I loved it I would play it with my wife and we would both both just be cackling laughing having a blast (laughs) about I mean the old intro was great I mean just you guys are just were funny and it's still i love how you pivoted and i love what mc does i love watching seeing him grow as a film like we talk about in our 20s early 20s is when we kind of grow into the film lovers we know this is what we love we got to see everything so i love hearing him talk about like he talked about paper moon and hearing him watch these classic movies that he kind of slyly throws in once in a while that he's watching in comparison to these blockbusters that you've kind of thrown at him that are kind of one one after another were like pretty stink pretty much stinkers he kind of got inaugurated with a bunch of stinkers right (laughs) off the get-go really those first couple episodes with alex man (laughs) oh Oh, man that was rough for him i know (laughs) i know yeah he was like is this is this what the rest of the year is gonna be like help me (laughs) oh my god what did i sign up for right exactly you guys still you know it's hard to to make the transition from one host to another I, i can only imagine and red was awesome and, and it was awesome to have that episode where he came back too. That was fantastic. Oh, was really oh my good. God. So much fun. So much fun to have him back. It was like, I felt bad because yeah. I was, I was uh, audio rolling over Alex and just, yeah. I was like, Oh, it's just Justin and I again. <laughs> so, well, it, it, yeah. You guys there for what, over, over a year and a half before he made the transition to the new host. And you know, yeah, I think I, it was, it was like a year and like a year and like three or four months, but yeah. yeah. But Alex is, you know, he seems like a really good kid. And I shouldn't say kid. I know he's in his 20s. He's doing really good, you know. And, yeah. and honestly, the you get the chemistry you guys have is really apparent on screen. And I love the fact that you guys do that little Q&A, too, after each episode where you talk yeah, about e- your lives and you're kind of getting to know each other. I thought that was also a really cool touch. Unlike- yeah, we wanted we wanted to find a way. I, I So I think the hard thing about a lot of uh, podcasts or review shows is – you don't really get a sense of who the hosts actually are. And, and so that's why when we started watch skip plus red and I had done the introductory episode where we just mm-hmm. talked about ourselves basically. Um, and I didn't really get to do that with Alex and mm-hmm. it, it was weird after a couple episodes, he, he sort of was like, we don't really know each other. Do you mind after we record, I ask you some personal questions. And I was like, no, I don't mind why don't we just record it and put it up? Right. And so we just started doing that. And yeah. Well, I think it's, the, it's the, the feedback, I don't know if you've gotten any feedback. I will say it's, I think that's also another, just like the plus, that's another really cool fe- feature that's unique because like you said, it does kind of like an open a window almost into your world. So we do get to know the people behind the the microphone, so to speak. So I, I think it's uh, really commendable and it, and it really, really works well. So definitely. Thank love you. It. 
Oh, you're and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for um, you guys, both of you, for all the kind words. Uh, oh, no I, hope, I hope to keep the, the show going. So, <laughs> yeah, well, we, we look forward to it every week. That's on the top of my list to listen. It's you, not a bomb. And of course, gentlemen's, you know, those three yeah. are the ones that I, I go to. And, and, and they get me through the week because you guys all have interesting takes on the stuff that you watch and you all have great personalities, which is part of the part of why you want to watch it. Like, I don't know about you, but I've watched and read these reviewers where it's i feel like these stodgy old reviewers that have watched <laughs> so many films like listen i've watched way too many films probably to myself but like they've watched so many films where i just feel like they just don't get it anymore you know what i mean like i don't know they, they almost become like the very obvious film snob the very cliched film snob and because of that i'm just turned off to that at least for me like oh it yeah just, it just seems so obvious you know or, or they're just so hardened and bitter that yeah. nothing, nothing, there's no enjoyment in whatever yeah, they see. Yeah. It's like almost like a mission to just take it down and be like, it'll never be a godfather. But, yeah, you know, but, that's the great thing about yeah. film is that, you know, each each vision is different. Yeah. Or, or how about the ones that are like, oh, I don't like the horror genre. So automatically I'm going to shit all over the part of my French, but I'm going to shit all over this movie. You know what I right. mean? It's like, how, how can you be that biased? How can you go into it? Listen, we all have things that we like, but how can you go into a film and be like, yeah, fuck this movie because I don't like that genre. You know, like right. that's to me, that's to me, that's you shouldn't be doing this job. Then You have to you have to go in with an open mind. If you're not willing to go in with an open mind. There's no point to it, you know, but, you know, that's just my two cents. It's a great direction for life, too. Yeah, right. No, I mean, absolutely. it's keep your mind open. Short. Life is short. Keep your eye. Uh, keep your mind open for certain. Absolutely. Um, so I guess with that, we'll go into what have you been watching? So that's our next segment of the show. And since you're our guest, we'll uh, ask you, what have you been watching, Jose? Anything good or? Anything uh, so <laughs> lots of bad. He's like, I <laughs> lots like of, that bad stuff. Lots of bad, lots of enjoyable it's stuff. Cool. So, um, you know, honestly, the the last the last week has been a little kind of crazy or busy for me. Yeah. And so this is strange. I have never watched Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. And wow. I love, I know Mike, Mike just reacted. Um, I um, I love Larry David. Uh, mm -hmm. He sort of came back into my mind after I had seen those articles about how he uh, choked Elmo, which I just thought was really funny. And then he like doubled down and was like, yeah. oh, no, I choke him again. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I, need, I think I need to see Curb Your Enthusiasm. So I actually started it from episode one and i i love it as somebody who could literally talk about nothing for two hours it's mm -hmm. fantastic and um i i i mean you know obviously it was shot i think it was like shot on red or early digital capture so it's yeah. very like even now it seems crude even though it's digital uh but i'm really really loving it so i i Got in. I started watching some of those. Um, I had rewatched Phantom of the Paradise. Oh, uh, Brian De Palma. De Palma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, some classic De Palma right there. I love that. Oh yeah, and it's just it's you know knowing that the the actress from Suspiria is in it, and then Paul Williams and the songs, and it's just it's it's kitschy and it's fun and it's it's kind of wonderful. Um, I was to be in a shadow cast for it, but unfortunately I had to drop out because things have been kind of crazy. Uh, so I had been watching that and sort of studying it in anticipation of that. Um, Randy and I, Randy is, uh, he's obviously big on the Gentleman's Guide Facebook page. We went and saw the first Omen. Um, oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, which... <sighs> Parts of it are good, but um, if anybody has seen Immaculate, there may be some weird terrible. deja vu with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it unfortunately just was not great. There were some good performances in it, but it just was not great. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently I also ended up seeing, I think Mike recommended it too, mm -hmm. uh, All of Us Strangers, which was finally on um, Hulu. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and not to spoil it, but it, it was weird. I have a weird take on the ending. Um, mm -hmm. A sad, sad take on the ending. But um, 
it's odd. It's a it's a it's a queer film uh, about two men, and uh, there's some interesting elements to it. Um, mm. Again, I don't want to say anything more because I think it'll spoil it, but it's yeah. definitely a watch. Please watch it. It's really good. Great performances. Paul Meskel, who I think they just released a teaser trailer for Gladiator 2, which mm. if you've been reading the trades, uh, Paul Meskel is supposed to be the grown son of Maximus, uh, not Maximus, I'm sorry, of the Joaquin Phoenix character. Oh, and okay. um yeah, and Ridley Scott is directing this. It's it's uh, Gladiator 2. But the fun, well, not the fun thing, but the interesting thing is, is the trades now have these articles saying that the movie is way over budget, that they're oh. not they're not shooting stuff. It's not been a good experience. Like, so oh. it's it's gonna be curious to see how this actually turns out. But Paul Meskel, um, from normal people as well as After Sun, which um Mike had recommended and I finally got to see because mm. I believe that was on the Sundance episode we talked about. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And then Andrew Scott, who is in the new Netflix Ripley show, he's the lead in all of us strangers as well. I just um, saw the trailer for that last night and that looks amazing. Yeah. The yeah. And yeah. so, and then um, the next episode of watch skip plus, which I just recorded uh, mm -hmm. And then jumped on with you guys. Uh, we talked about Alex Garland's Civil War. And for the first time, because this happened a lot on Watch Skip Plus, Red would start, we would start discussing a film and then he would change his opinion. Literally, it would go from a skip to a watch or it would go in the reverse. Mm -hmm. And for the first time with MC, one of us had those conversions after a very... Oh shall we say, strong reaction to the first viewing. So uh, mm. check that out. But yeah, uh, Alex Garland, great filmmaker, always yeah. making interesting movies. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's- out for the camera. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And for writing, very strong writer. Yeah. Um, I never got to see that devs show on FX or Hulu, but I'm dying to check it out now, so. Awesome, man. Very cool. Well, that this is, you know, it's surprisingly, don't beat yourself about uh, about Curb Your Enthusiasm. I'll admit, I've never seen Curb Your Enthusiasm either, but I want to see it because I, I hear the basis of it is improv throughout most yeah. of the humor. And I am a huge fan when it comes to anything improv. One of my favorite things improv. is still watching, whose line is it anyway? I go on oh, TV yeah. and watch the old episodes just because at my heart, my core, I love comedy probably more than anything else. And that shows oh, yeah. it cracks me up and i've heard that with curve your enthusiasm most of the the show is non-scripted and it, they use a, a heavy dose of uh improv so i've been on the fence about it but i've been very curious about seeing that for quite a while you now need so, to see it you need to see uh, it. it's i you know i put on the first episode with scooter my husband yeah and i was cracking up and he sort of was like this is so awkward and i'm like it's supposed to be <laughs> it's supposed to be and i love it yeah i yeah you've got to check it out it's it's pretty fantastic so before you move on i'm just asking yeah, you know john have you have you ever tried your hand at improv because you know uh just from doing community theater myself uh, -huh. uh improv is Gary, you want to talk about high wire or no safety net? Improv is super scary because there is no script. And yeah. you, you have this thing where you're just constantly like, well, what if I improv the wrong way? Right. But I'm just wondering, have you ever have you ever tried your hand at it or so improv specifically? No. I mean, I have actually worked on some like local homegrown like indie films in the area, like short nice. film, as well as a couple features behind this behind the scenes and then in front of the camera as well. Um, just like I said, homegrown stuff that played at local film festivals, a couple of them played at like New York and some stuff like that, but I've never done improv, but I respect the hell out of anyone that does oh, yeah. improv or live theater. Um, it just, you just gotta have so much courage to get out there and just go for it in both those examples. So I, I would love to give it a shot. I've always, I've always thought, thought the idea of doing something like that or even stand up comedy would be awesome just because 
it's just so much fun. You're just going up there. Hopefully you have a good idea of what you want to say and what you want to do, but then you're just going for it. And I, I think it just takes a lot of courage to be able to do something like that. So yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, Mike, what have you been watching this week? Okay. So going back to curb, I finished, uh, the last season of curb your enthusiasm and the finale is goddamn beautiful. I cried. Yeah. I weeped. I laughed. It is just, it's wonderful. I loved every second of the finale. If, yeah. if you're going to binge the show and get to it, I can only imagine how successful that finale is going to fit. He basically, and especially if you've seen Seinfeld, because yeah. they kind of basically redo the Seinfeld finale. So it's, it's brilliant. And as much as people have complained about the Seinfeld finale, they kind of go through and fix some things and it is amazing. But the whole arc yeah. of the season is basically about, Larry going to Atlanta and giving uh, a friend of his uh, um, a bottle of water who's in line to vote and he gets arrested. So the whole season <laughs> arc is is all leading up to him going to, to trial for giving um, Mrs. Black, who's from like season seven, a bottle of water. Uh, so yeah, it's hilarious. And, and again, there people come back from older episodes and uh, past seasons. And if you've been a fan, let's. I started watching the show in a past life, 2003, I think, is when I first started watching it. Me and my first wife, we would go to the rental store, and you could rent an entire season for a weekend for like a couple dollars more than a movie. And so we would. So I. That's when I started was renting in a whole season of the first Curb Your Enthusiasm, which included the original Larry David pre plot mm -hmm. or prequel thing, and then the season itself. So I love it. I love it more than Seinfeld. I think it's one of the greatest uh, television comedy shows that's ever ran 23 years, ever known. It's 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 wonderful. Um, then I went down to a sad note and I watched the Robin Williams documentary by Marina Zenovich called Come Inside My Mind. I finished it this morning and I bawled my eyes out. I loved it so mm. much. I am a huge Robin Williams fan. He's somebody that I've reminds me of my dad, his silliness, his goofiness. My family watched those Robin Williams uh, stand up and movies all throughout my childhood. So mm. he was really a big part of me. And that when he passed in 2014, there was really rough and oh that was devastating yeah no yeah, he's one of the, one of the great rough and it's a great freaking documentary it's done so well the i mean it basically you could tell the family just gave marina's all this wonderful footage i've actually seen marina shook her hand she did a, an awesome document about uh roman polanski she's done a couple about him at sundance so this is one that did premiere at sundance i think in 2018 and i missed and i had sat on it because i knew i was going to be an emotional mess i kind of felt like i needed to get some emotions out today so or last night we started it, finished it this morning, and it's beautiful. If you're a Robin Williams fan, watch it, but just be prepared to cry. It's it's a wonderful film, and it really does him justice. Um, I just can't say enough about it. And if you haven't seen any of Marina Zenovic's films, she's really good. Um, I definitely would recommend uh, either of those uh, Roman Polanski docs. She's kind of controversial on her takes on some of that stuff, but I would definitely look her up uh there's a couple other things uh i should have listened to cupcake and you guys i went and we watched argyle <laughs> oh, uh, oh, oh no i still haven't seen it but after everything everyone said i'm like oh i don't know it's the worst movie of the year i'm gonna say it and i've seen madam webb and i love madam webb way more <laughs> argyle is a pile of shit it's so bad it is literally bad. And there's this whole sequence in the end without spoiling anything where there's like this color smoke that should be super cool, but it's um, so dumb and corny and cheesy. And I, it's so bad. And I'm sitting here thinking they spent $230 million on this movie. And those two, the most miscast couple in movie history. Why in God's green earth did they cast those two? They had no and I, I don't want to talk – if you know yeah. Arbor Guile, you know who they are. I love those two actors. I love them both. But, man, they're so bad in this movie. Just, oh, don't see it. Don't don't even push play on Apple. Don't get curious. Because my kids were like, let's watch it. They watched the first half, and then I got stuck watching the second half by myself. That horrendous finale twist, stupid <laughs> – I, I actually like those it. two – I actually like those two sequences you're talking about at the end. <laughs> But by the time they come up, the 
whole experience has just been miserable. So bad. Yeah, it's it, it's bad. It's this capstone by her stupid face. That whole it's just so smug the whole time. I'm just like, oh, why do you make her so unlikable? I just didn't get it. I've liked her in almost everything I've seen her in. I mean, I even like her in those first two Jurassic World movies, but this was yeah. <laughs> the worst thing she's ever done. I had to, then uh, again, we made the mistake of watching something for nostalgia that I thought would be fun. It's middling. I will, we watched the uh, Fairly Brothers remake of The Heartbreak Kid uh, starring Ben Stiller. Um, uh, it is, it's a mess. There's things I really like about it. I like that it's less like, it's less fairly than anything they'd done. I think up to that point, it felt a little like they were doing a straight rom-com than kind mm -hmm. of a silly farcical uh, slapstick thing. Just, it just depends on how much you like Ben. He's kind of obnoxious throughout the film. His character's not likable at all. <laughs> I, I don't know. For me personally, I thought the film was okay, but it's too long. It's a mess. When they kind of try to go crude in the movie, it sticks out like a sore thumb. I kind of wish they would have made a decision to go raunchier with it or just pull back like they did with Fever Pitch, which I think works better as a straight straight up rom-com, which I thought this was going to be similar to, but at times they were trying to be too raunchy. I do like Ackerman, I think is her name. I think she's great. I liked her in, she's hilarious. She did all this stuff for Adult Swim back in the uh, early 2010s called Children's Hospital. If you can get a hold of any of those, they are hilarious. I think they might be on Max, but she's great. But the movie itself kind of me, I'd say maybe if I rated things, it'd be like a two out of five. It's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then I finished it off with uh, what I was hoping would be a double feature. I rewatched The Omen, which I hadn't seen since I was really young. The original um, Donner. I loved the hell out of it, this rewatch. I remember thinking it was slow and plotting originally but this time around it popped man that movie has just so much style just so much darkness to it so much 70s to it i it just really is is great and i i rewatched it for the i wanted to watch the uh omen prequel but also because the guys at uh raiders of the podcast reviewed it and they all just poured love on it pretty much and i have always kind of thought of the franchise as middling so I'm an idiot. I'm really like, I went back and watched it. I'm like, I'm, I'm dumb. This is a great movie. And now I got to watch all of them because it really is a masterpiece. So what did you think having watched both, Jose? Uh, what do you think about the series from what you've seen? You know, I honestly, one, two, and three, I love one, two, and three. Um, four, meh, the remake wasn't bad. The Omen remake with uh, Julia Stiles wasn't bad, but you, you can't beat the original. The thing I love about the original is, is uh, you know, it it works the audience into sort of like an amoral place. Like at the end yeah. of that movie, you're like, kill that kid, stab that kid, <laughs> save the world. And it's like, wow, when a screenplay makes the audience do that, it's pretty fantastic. Um, I will I will say that the first omen, I you know, the story isn't bad, but I but it's strange that it borrows not only from the first omen, pun intended, uh Donner's omen, but also it borrows from things like the Exorcist and Rosemary's baby and all of these things. And so it just feels like a a boring pastiche versus the sort of masterpiece that the original is. And I think do I, I I seem to remember Selzer, David Selzer, who wrote it. I think he just created the the sort of story whole cloth. It's not from a novel. It's not from anything else. Mm. And um, yeah, thank God for 70s cinema for those sort of out there or brave ideas and then bringing them to the cinema. So it's it's great. Gregory Peck is great. I mean, oh, you can it, never go wrong with Gregory Peck. Oh, yeah. But then even just the shockingness of everything, like you know david warner and his performance and the woman hanging oh. herself it's all for you damien <laughs> it's crazy it's you know and the dogs and the yeah. sense of foreboding it's pretty it's it's pretty cool by the way if you have not seen the omen series i actually thought they did pretty good with it um yeah. there was only one season it was sort of like uh, i think damien was you know in his 20 somethings or what have you but um, it's worth checking out. I really wish there would have been a second season, but yeah. Pretty cool. 
Well, it sounds like I've got lots of stuff to mind because I really did like that original Omen. And I have seen the remake, which was like almost like the Psycho remake. If I, it seemed like it was so like really Almost similar. shot for shot, yeah. Is that what yeah. it was? Because it, it felt so similar almost now. Because I remember seeing the original and then I saw the remake and I didn't catch that it was so similar until I'd watched the original again. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just remember some of these images almost exactly and some of the things really exactly. So I, I, yeah, I mean, I think Leif Schreiber was fine in it, but otherwise it's yeah. pretty much the exact same movie. Even the kills are the same. So mm. no, no real um, necessary, but I haven't seen the others. I guess I need to watch oh. two, three. I've heard some people say four is fun if you want to watch something dumb. And then yeah. I, I'm still going to watch the prequel because man, if it, I've heard some people say it really works as a nice prequel. And as I'm watching the original again, I'm like, Ooh, I want to know more about this. I want to more know about this. But just like you said, I'm like, is this going to be like Immaculate? Uh, which I loved. I loved Immaculate at the time. So, so, so to a certain extent, the first Omen does sort of flesh things out. But I feel like it thinks the audience is stupid, especially the way they connect the film to mm -hmm. to the first Omen. But the final conflict, man, Sam Neill. Wow, that one. Honestly, out of all of the films, that's the one that I have rewatched the most that I really love. Uh, the Omen Three, final, the final conflicts, good. I think so I'm gonna good. give him a try. Yeah, I think I'm yeah. gonna give him a try. <laughs> okay, John, what about you? What have you seen? Yeah. Uh, before we so get to compared the to you, heavyweights, man, I'm the lightweight here in the contending room yeah. here, the boxing ring, so to speak. I only had like three things. It's just we work this week has just been nuts. So I just haven't had a chance to watch a lot of stuff. So the first thing I did was watch a documentary about Norm Macdonald, because of course I'm a sick I'm a sick fuck. And when I think of OJ and I hear of him dying, my first thought was it wasn't like a normal person would be like, oh no, someone died. Be like, you know what? Fuck that guy. He deserved it. And then my first thought was thinking back to all the Saturday Night Live week after week with Norm Macdonald just verbally gut punched him over and over again and so i watched like a 13 minute clip of norm mcdonald just doing that and afterwards i'm like there's a norm mcdonald documentary it's only like an hour long but it's really great it just goes into norm mcdonald's life uh his origins his struggle to become a comedian of course it touches on him getting fired from saturday night live because he pissed off an executive because of the whole oj jokes um, but it's just called a norm. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Like I said, it's just under an hour. And I love Norm McDonald. I love his humor. I highly, highly recommend. So that's what I start the week off with. Um, last night, I started watching this show on Netflix because I couldn't sleep, of course. It's called Baby Reindeer. Um, it's this Scottish actor. Um, and he came up with the idea about basically a guy that was had a situation where he was being stalked. He, this this real life actor was being stalked um, by this girl. So he decided to take that experience and write it into this mini series. And the mini series is you have this guy, Donnie Dunn, and he's at a bar. He's a bartender. And there's this girl that seems a little bit off. She seems like she's a loner. She has a hard time with connecting with people. And he decides to like go over there and like kind of cheer her up and kind of make her feel good about herself. What happens is she kind of latches on to him and she basically becomes a stalker. And through each episode, it gets more and more intense. She's like, oh, what, when can we go on our, our first date? You want to go on a date with me? And you can see he's like, oh, I don't want to do this. She sees the crick. He realizes like she's a little bit off. And then the more he gets to know her, the darker it gets. And then he goes on the internet and he finds out that she was arrested for stalking someone at her last job. And it just goes down this crazy rabbit hole. Um, and it starts, uh, the lead actor is Richard Gadd. Like I said, he's a Scottish, Scottish actor. Um, he's playing the character of Donnie Dunn. And then the other lead is our stalker, uh, Jessica Gunning. Um, she was in, her name is Martha, by the way. Uh, she was in a great TV show on Prime called Outlaws, which is a really great ensemble piece. It's got uh, Christopher Walken, and a bunch oh, of other yeah. actors from the UK. And she plays like a really like wacky, but like harmless, goofy character. She goes from that to like basically like a Norman Bates type character in this in this show. Um, literally, like I said, I couldn't sleep last night. I was just having a really hard time. 
I sat through six episodes and I was like, man, I just can't turn it off. So it's just a really compelling, um, interesting show. I think it just dropped on Netflix probably within maybe the last week or so. So I definitely would highly recommend that. Definitely a really good show. Or did you um, say that what country of origin is it? Um, it's from the uh, UK. I think oh, okay. it's originally so the British. UK miniseries. Yeah. Um, the poster is a little disturbing. <laughs> it is, right? <laughs> Trust me. Once you start watching, you're going to get hooked. It's one of those shows. Um, I didn't think I'd sit through six episodes at 11 o'clock at night. I literally started at 11 o'clock at night. Needless to say, it's three o'clock in the morning, and here I am still watching this stupid show, you know? So <laughs> wow, it's one of those, okay. and it's not a stupid show, but it's one of those things you just get hooked, man, you know? So did you I ever start... see you on Netflix? I did. You. No, I don't think I've done. I've never seen With, you. With uh, I... Penn, Penn Badgley. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so okay. basically, basically, it, you know, it's kind of like what Baby Reindeer is, only it's told from the perspective of the stalker. <laughs> so, oh, I yes. check that out. Yeah, I'm it's good. Gonna... It's it's run like three seasons. It's fantastic. Wow, that's that is interesting. I got to check that out for sure. Um, so yeah, I saw that, and then finally I saw this is, was last week in the theaters. It was probably already been gone since then, but it's a movie called Wicked Little Letters. Um. And it takes place in this small town, again, in the UK, uh, during the 1920s, 1930s. And it's this small little town where everybody knows each other and everybody's very religious and tight lipped. And you have the people that gossip about each other. And, you know, it's this kind of like um, just very small, tight knit community. And basically you have this young Irish girl um, who moves over to from from Ireland to the UK um, named Jess. Her name is uh, Rose Gooding. It's, she's played by Jessica Buckley. Um, and she gets in there and she's a loud mouth Irish person. I know that because I'm a loud mouth Irish person. <laughs> she's <laughs> drinking, you know, she does her own thing. She parties a little too hard, but she's also on the same token, a good mom and generally a good person. She's just very vocal about saying what's on her mind. So there's this whole scandal that goes on um with a character played by olivia coleman um and basically people start receiving letters in town these nasty letters basically talking shit about everyone in town and of course <laughs> the first person they go to is the loudmouth irish person i don't know if that's just if that's not discrimination guys i don't know what is you know us damn irish people we're, <laughs> we're always getting pegged all it's always it's always the drunken irish person in the corner so like everybody in town is like basically getting targeted and they're all saying, OK, it's this girl. Um, and the whole movie is this really silly, over the top comedy um, combined with like a whodunit mystery. Um, I had seen Olivia Coleman. You guys probably know her from like Wonka and a bunch of other stuff. Um, she, she got like a, a nominated for, uh, I think, uh, the Judy Garland movie. And she's been a, like a whole slew of different things. Um, but the Jessica, no, excuse me, Jesse Buckley, um, this Irish actress, I've never heard of her before. Apparently, she's been in uh, Fargo for 10 episodes, uh, this TV series, and she was nominated for a BAFTA Awards for uh, the, this movie called Law, The Lost Daughter. So um, I was really impressed, you know, like just a really good performances. And it was one of these movies that they didn't advertise for at all. You know, I just was going on my AMC app and I'm going, oh, I wonder what's planned this week. And this just popped up. And I was like, you know what? This is one of those movies. It's going to be gone in a week if I don't go see it. So I just took a chance on it. And it was just a really phenomenal movie. I think it's going to be one of those movies at the end of the year where I wouldn't be surprised if you see some nominations for some of the performances. So definitely check that out if you get a chance. It's really worth seeking out. So, uh, yeah, that pretty much uh, wraps what I've been watching this week. Um, I guess next, if you guys want, we can go into some of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, if you'd like to, Jose, if you want to talk a little bit about the crew and that kind of stuff. And then afterwards, I'll get into like the cast and, and what have you not about our feature film, The Devils. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> first, first, before we do that, Jesse Buckley, super great. You have to see her in two movies one it's called beast uh b-e-a-s-t um okay. uh so she meets this guy that she's sort of like fallen in love with and then she has mm -hmm. all these sort of like thoughts like wait a minute could he 
could he be darker than what she believes? And then she was also in Alex Garland's Men, which was his third oh. third film oh, with with Rory Kinnear. And uh, at MC and I really kind of got a little bit into discussing that film because there mm-hmm. was a lot of misogyny that was sort of lodged against that, that it was uh, stereotypical of women being you know, meek, afraid, timid, always second guessing everything when it comes to intimate relationships. Um, But I think the, I think Garland's screenplay has more to say than just that. And it Mm. is a unique film. You will not see a movie quite like that. Uh, In fact, it's uncategorizable if, if, if you will. Well, those are the best type of films. So that's awesome. Yes. I was, like I said, I had never seen her before in anything. um, And I was impressed because like, when you're following this movie, this character, you're, it's easy to just be like, okay, it's the loudmouth Irish person making trouble. Of course, she's the one that went around writing all these nasty letters to these people. And um, it's easy to go down that that way of thinking, but then you expand upon the character and you see, wow, this this girl's really got talent, you know? And you really see she's got some acting punches. So I, like I said, I was really impressed by what she did. So I'm definitely going to be looking forward to seeing that one for sure. Um, Randy loved Wicked Little Letters. He says it's oh, probably really? one of the best of the year. Oh, yeah. okay. Nice. Very and he was cool. like, and it's only an hour and 40 minutes, so none of this two hour and 20 minute bullshit. So, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. That stuff gets old real quick, right? For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we call this below the line, uh, which yes. is sort of the, indus- the industry term for the production people. So your directors, all of your people, quote unquote, below the line. So above the line are the talent, the actors, and uh, below the line are, is pretty much everybody else. So Ken Russell's a really interesting cat. So I think I'm going to leave him for the last, but um, our director of photography is a gentleman named David Watkin. He is a British cinematographer and an innovator. And it's sort of interesting. I'm I'm going to tell you what he innovated and it's kind of like, oh, that's like everywhere. But uh, when he was starting out, he would do things like using bounce light to make the image look soft. And now it's like, that's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. But back then in the 60s and the 70s, he was sort of pioneering that, that sort of soft look and using bounce light. Um, He is inspired by Dutch painters like uh, Vermeer. Um, And another innovation that he did was not to get into the weeds too much, but um, there is light sensitivity. So when we talk about film stock, fast film is usually if you're going to be filming something where there's a lot of uh, low light, where there's low light or it's dark. And then so slow film you want when it's really, really bright. And so it affects the sensitivity. Well, the great thing about Watkin was he flipped it. So for uh, exteriors where it was really bright, he used fast film. And again, it gave that softer look. And then for low light or darker interiors, he used slow film, which really is kind of an art because if the slow film is sensitive to or or it develops slower because of the amount of light, imagine dealing with a low light exterior. And so um, this is stuff that he learned. He started, um, he was in the British army for a brief time. And then he ended up shooting, uh, one of his first films was uh, Richard Lester's 1965 film, The Knack and How to Get It In. Um, and how to get it, sorry. That actually won the Palm Door. And one of before he became a cinematographer, Watkin, one of his first jobs was shooting the title sequence for Goldfinger. Um, so, you know, he's worked with Richard Lester, Tony Richardson, Mike Nichols, Franco Zeffirelli, Ken Russell, Sidney Lumet. He won an Academy Award for Best Cinematography for Out of Africa, which is where he plied all of these tricks and really made that movie so beautiful looking. Um, he got a he's received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the British Society of Cinematographers, um, and he's probably most known for his photography for Chariots of Fire. So think about Ben Cross and all of those lean British boys running in slow motion down the beach. That's that's all Watkin. Um, 
Our music is by Peter Maxwell Davies. He's actually a prolific classical and orchestral composer. And he sort of came to Ken Russell's attention by um, something, the score he had written for 1969's Eight Songs for a Mad King. Um, and that was sort of like musical parody. So what what Davies was doing at the time was he was taking something that everybody knew, like uh, Handel's Messiah, and then he subverted it by changing the music and adding some sort of weird, like, tones to it as well. And so that film was about the madness of King George. Um, and he had sort of changed things around there. A great thing, a cool thing about Peter Maxwell Davies was he was um, one of the first classical composers to actually open a music download website. So remember dial up and all those things. Well, oh, he sort of innovated, which is, which is kind of cool. One of the first websites where you could download music. He was also also openly gay and was a lifelong supporter of gay rights. He was the vice president of the Campaign for Homosexual Equality in the UK. He was also an environmentalist as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so he had actually writ written something called the Yellow Cake Review. And that was a collection of cabaret style pieces that he performed with actress Eleanor Braun as a protest uh, for the plan to mine uranium ore in Orkney, uh, England. Um, so again, mainly classical and orchestral, but he did go through a period in the 60s where his compositions were very grand and experimental and tended towards like kind of like a violent sort of overtone, which you can totally see in the score here. Mm. Um, before I get to Ken Russell, there's two other shout outs. The production design here is by noted queer filmmaker Derek Jarman. And so Jarman is known for his films like Tempest, Blue. Um, I remember uh, being in high school and seeing Edward II and being like, whoa, what am I watching here? Like yeah. it's super gay and super odd. Um, but Jarman, yeah, he's pretty fantastic, but he was the production designer here. It took It took him three months to construct the sets here but the set for Loudon, Loudon, sorry, Loudon, um, three months to design, and it was the largest set constructed on Pinewood Studios' backlot since Cleopatra in 1963. Um, Jarman is pretty fantastic. If you have not seen any of his other movies, they are quite an experience, almost like Russell mm. himself in his films. Mm. Uh, interestingly enough, the prop designer for this film, uh, had noted that Jarman was very inexperienced um, mm -hmm. and found the work on this film very exhaustive and difficult, which you would never think of because the production design in this film is incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, there's there's stuff in this, like the sets where you're just like, how did they do all this? And then to learn that it was all like, foam and plaster and that you could push over like the walls and stuff um it's it's just it's fantastic absolutely fantastic and then an associate editor on this film is a gentleman named Stuart Baird B A I R D who mm -hmm. is probably one of the best film editors ever i won't go through his entire resume but just google mm -hmm. him he eventually became a director and directed executive decision with Ken uh Ken Russell Kurt Russell, the other Russell, um, and Steven Seagal. So if you if you remember that, that was about like terrorists taking over a plane. Yeah. And um, he also, much to the ire of, are, are they called Trekkers or Trekkies? I think Trekkies. Yeah, yeah. I, think I thought Trekkies, Trekkies was the insult and Trekkers was the proper name. I don't know, but yeah, but really... much much to the ire of Trek Trekkers. Oh. Baird had never seen a Star Trek film or movie or television show at all. And he was mm -hmm. like, I'll take the job of directing Star Trek Nemesis. And um, people hated him for it. But anyway, Stuart Baird, I love him. He's he's yeah. fantastic. Uh, okay, so moving on to Ken Russell. Man, this, this cat, holy cow. First of all, his deal is to shock people. As if you have yeah, not gotten absolutely. that from this film, um, but a lot of his films are 
designed, intentionally designed to shock people. Ken Russell himself is very interesting because he started directing for the BBC um, and he made a lot of creative adaptations and movies about composer, music composers' lives, which was sort of weird, right? It's like, why that subject? But Russell is known for his very flamboyant and controversial style. Um, he is probably best known for 1969's Women in Love, which is an adaptation of a very beloved D.H. Lawrence novel or mm. erotica. It's actually a lot of D.H. Lawrence work has been banned. Um, but he was uh, won, won an Academy Award, I believe. No, wait a minute. I think he was nominated for Academy Award, but he, did he win? I can't remember. I'm researching him. I should have known whether he won or not. Um, but none, nonetheless, Women in Love is, yeah. is his big pioneering achievement. And it really broke taboos because up until that point, full male frontal nudity was absolutely forbidden. And there is a very famous naked wrestling scene between Oliver Reed and Alan Bates in it. It's not the only reason to see it. Some of the narrative is also very uh, experimental. Many would know Russell for the fantasy musical film uh, based around The Who, the rock band The Who, um, Tommy. And then yeah. his one and only big studio picture, and apparently after that he got blacklisted in Hollywood, was 1980's Altered States, which is probably one of my all-time favorite movies, but it is a weird, trippy film based on a novel by Patty Chayefsky. Um, Russell and Chayefsky famously fought. I think Russell even copped to being drunk on set. But mm -hmm. there are some amazing visuals in that movie. William Hurt is in it. Uh, Blair Brown is in it. It's 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 really fantastic. Um, you know, Women in Love would be his signature um, his signature film, basically for Oscars nominations. I don't think he won, but only his his only nomination for Best Director. Um, so he starts working at the BBC. He's doing all of these sort of like documentaries. He did a film. Uh, this is where the controversy follows him. In 1970, he did a film called Dance of the Seven Veils. And this was about German composer Richard Strauss. Mm. And um, his idea was to shock British television audiences because this was a miniseries. He said he wanted to shock them out of their complacency of sitting, and I quote, in front of their sets for hours on end watching Coco advertisements. And so the film is full of gratuitous sex scenes and he all but intimated that Strauss was a Nazi sympathizer. Uh, and that promptly made the Strauss estate pull the rights for the music and the movie got banned. And so oh. until the rights for Strauss's music actually went into the public domain. And that was actually recently, I think 2019, mm. the film Dance of the Seven Veils was never screened. It was eventually screened again, mm. once the rights went publicly and his um, Ken Russell's widow actually put that on because nobody had seen it. Um, wow. So up until the time of the devils, he had done that film and then he did um, The Music Lovers with Glenda Jackson uh, yeah. and, and Richard Chamberlain. And then, of course, Women in, Women in Love. And then that brings us to The Devils, which, you know, I mean, this film, basically, it was banned. Uh, it's based on a play called The Devils, as well as a book by Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley should be familiar to all of you in high school because we were all forced to read Brave New World, which he also wrote as well. Um, but this film was so controversial that you can barely find it on home media. You can barely find it streaming. It got an X by the censors. It is full of this like religious iconography, but at the same time, it, you know, he does things on film that are very vulgar and offensive, even by today's standards. I think if even oh, the absolutely. youngins watch this, they will be shocked. They will be, you know, sort of like freaked out. Um, Russell claimed that he was a devout Catholic um, and was very secure in his faith when he did this and shot this movie. He calls this movie his really his only one and only political 
statement actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And as the lore goes, uh, United Artists read his screenplay for this Mm -hmm. and they refused to touch it. And they were like, forget it, we're not doing it. Warner Brothers snapped it up, but as they were looking at the dailies, they got really worried about some of the things that they were seeing, um, stuff that we're going to, eventually obviously why, talk right? about I can only, yeah I can only, I can only imagine. <laughs> mm, why i wonder why and so you know the rest of russell's filmography is a lot like this he's again yeah. he's known for his flamboyant style he likes actors to be theatrical so if yeah. you go into a russell film and you expect shakespeare like acting you ain't gonna get it um yeah. but some of the films that jump out are Crimes of Passion with Kathleen Turner, where she leads a sort of a double life as like, I believe she was a teacher, but then she's also a hooker. Um, But then Anthony Perkins is like her stalker and there's like a razor line dildo. Yeah. And then Gothic with Julian Sands and Gabriel Byrne. Um, I love that movie. It's like very hallucinatory and out there. And, And Julian Sands, who recently passed away, I mean, he was just a beautiful, talented man. Um, Lair of the White Worm, again, Another very controversial. Yeah. yeah, fantastic, based on the Bram Stoker uh, novella. The Rainbow, another D.H. Lawrence um, update. Whore, which I just like to say as a teenager, um, that was <laughs> with Teresa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> that was obviously about a hooker, and it starred Teresa yeah. Russell. No relation, um, but that also caused a lot of controversy uh he did the bbc miniseries lady chatterley starring natasha richardson who i believe is related to vanessa redgrave if i'm not mistaken um Mm. and shot a very young and naked sean bean so of course i own that on several different media which i love (laughs) um and russell even directed a brian adams video like what 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 is this i I don't understand (laughs) yeah quite quite the character and i also left out that he wanted to be a ballet dancer that was his big thing growing up he wanted to be a ballet dancer and instead sojourned his way into british service in the military and then came out and eventually you know ended at the bbc um unless i got that wrong if he was in the no yeah he joined the royal air force and the british british merchant navy and once he got out he actually um had short careers in like photography and dance itself and then found himself at the BBC. So very cool. interesting cat. And this, you know, you guys have inspired me to re-examine his entire catalog and maybe even collect most of his films. I have a lot of his films on DVD, but I would yeah. like to upgrade to Blu-ray. Me and Mike were just talking a little bit before you joined us. Um, and we both have only seen a handful of things. So I've seen I've seen horror. I just saw that recently because I wanted to watch it because I know Raiders of the Podcast are going to be covering it this weekend. Uh, yeah. So I saw that. Uh, I saw Lair of the White Worm. I saw Gothic. I saw Tommy. And I saw The Devils. And here's yeah. my, my general consensus. I won't give away my review yet of this film. But my general consensus, whether you love or hate, you're never going to be bored. Yes. By any of the <laughs> I've only seen five films. And I was thoroughly entertained each film. I was never, I never walked away and was like, man, that fucking thing sucked. So <laughs> that that in itself, you know, says something because there's so many filmmakers that don't have anything interesting to say and they're just bland. So right. Or well, if it's if it's all style and no substance, right? Yeah. And um, I think he marries both those worlds. Oh yeah. And and by the way, I think Arrow put out a recent Crimes of Passion edition. Um Ooh definitely check that out definitely i'm definitely gonna look that into that for sure awesome man well dude here's what i'm gonna say another thing man i'm like a slacker you just like went through like this whole research paper i feel like you just wrote like a term paper for our show you know basically that's awesome that's what it does i I write term papers term papers weekly for our episodes yeah so like you're not the amount of detail you went into your research that's that's awesome man you really you went above and beyond so we, we appreciate it especially well obviously like i said we appreciate you coming on today to talk about this movie i'm so oh, excited yeah. I thank you i didn't realize you and mike had never seen it so i thought that in itself is going to be cool i had only seen it once and that was a year ago 
Um, so it's really just good to sit there and have like cool conversation about it. So, you know, good job. Um, I guess I'll touch on the cast. I don't know if I'll be able to follow that up, Jose. <laughs> I don't have that much research. I'm going to just touch on the, the cast um, and the history um, part of it. And I'm only going to touch on it. I'm not going to go into it. I would say when I get into the history part, if you guys are interested, it's a tough read. I'm about two chapters in. The book by Aldous Huxley, uh, The Devils of Ludlin. I got a Kindle copy. And it is a tough read, but it is interesting. And apparently, from what I understand, it's supposed to have like a ton more of information. And apparently, it's the movie's crazy, but the book goes into even crazier stuff that you didn't think the film could get crazier. But the real truth is actually even nuttier. So I'm going to yeah. actually try to finish that book um, at some point. I just couldn't get through the entire book for the, for the episode. Um, but all that, after all my rambling here, um, I'm going to get into the cast a little bit. Uh, starting with our man, Oliver Reed. Um, he plays the lead character of Urban Grandia. Um, he was known for stuff like Oliver in 68. Um, he obviously was in Tommy. Uh, the Big Sleep in 78, which I still haven't seen. You would think that's a iconic movie, another one that I have to put on my list. Um, so a good. childhood favorite. Condor Man, of course, yes. I talked about that one. Um, in 81, he played the the big bad guy. Um, Gladiator in 2000. Now, have you guys heard the story about Gladiator? He was yep. in Gladiator, he died, and then he was on his day off, and he got into a drinking contest with some guy in a bar, and basically, like, I think he drank, like, three bottles of whiskey, and then he just fucking died. That yeah. Yeah. Says a little bit something about how this guy led his life. You know, he definitely uh, didn't play by the rules. He definitely you know, was a little on the crazy side. There's there's a story that when he was filming um, either Women in Love or something else, he was known for essentially getting blasted at one bar, taking off all of his clothes and walking to another bar and asking to be served. Yeah, the man was, yeah. he, he was, was out there. And, you know, it's funny uh, I was watching this with my husband and I was uh, like, Oh God, Oliver Reed. Like I'm, I'm such a fan girl for him. And he's, yeah. uh, my husband was like, Ugh, he's not pretty. And I'm like, you shush your mouth. He's, he's, I don't know his <laughs> confidence and, uh, you know, just the way he portrays himself and just the craziness. I was like, that's kind of sexy. I mean, Maybe not everybody's brand is sexy, but it's mine. I agree with you. I, when, I, when I was talking to John, I said yeah. that he was like walking sex appeal. He walks yeah. in the movie and it's just like you feel like those screaming nuns walking, watching the Beatles walk in. And you're just yeah. like, holy shit, I'm straight as mm -hmm. fuck. But this guy is got it. Oh, it's like a magnetism for him, a certain charisma. Absolutely. <laughs> it's not the best comparison, but here's the comparison I'm going to kind of make. And just walk with me through this a little bit. He reminds me almost of an exaggerated, slightly drunken, slightly crazier version, UK version of Burt Reynolds. No, no, yes. no. Like, well, I know I'm, I'm taking some leaps and bounds no, with no, that. No, no. But like, no. he reminds me of like that, that, that persona, but just take it to the next level. You know what I mean? Oh, um, yeah. So, I didn't, like I said, I'm a little bit of a lightweight. I don't go fully, uh, I'm just mainly touching guys on the stuff that, you know, the, the movies that he was known for. Also, uh, The Adventures of Baron Monchusen in 88, you know, Terry yeah. Gilliam classic. Um, so yeah, I just touched on some of the films that people like that aren't familiar with a lot of like the smaller films and stuff like that you and I might be familiar with. They might go, oh, okay, I know, obviously I know Gladiator and stuff like that. Um, next we have Vanessa Redgrave, who plays mm -hmm. Sister Jean, or as I like to call her, the crazy obsessed nun. Yes. Um, she was in uh, Camelot in 67. Uh, Little Odessa, believe it or not. I don't know if anybody remembers that film. That came out yep. in 94. This one was surprising. I didn't remember her appearance in this, but the original Mission Impossible movie in 96. With Brian, up, directed by Brian De Palma. She, yeah, another, so... So this is interesting, and I don't know if many people caught this. Um, oh God, now I'm blanking on it. Uh, the actress she shows up in the she showed up in the last two movies. She's like icy blonde Kim Novak times a thousand. Uh -huh. Vanessa Kirby. Um, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. So her character 
is is related it's she's either the daughter or the granddaughter of the vanessa redgrave character from the first oh, mission okay. impossible that's um cool. so that's how she's that's how she's ingrained in the criminal network and why she knows so much because mm -hmm. she inherited that network from the redgrave character um yeah, oh, I'm you. sorry. I'm I'm a Mission Impossible whore. I love those movies so much. <laughs> I love the Mission Impossible movies, but I haven't seen for some reason. I just haven't seen, re, re, done a rewatch on the first one in years. Oh, I remember, De Palma, I remember the John, so good. Seeing, for some reason, the second one sticks in my mind. The John Woo one, just because it's so you know it's typical John Woo like, yes. especially with American stuff, the crazy stuff with the the motorcycle duel, you know, and, and the, the, you know all the crazy touches like the that. Spinning the spinning cars dancing and the yeah the, yeah. yeah. All those the... crazy, John, <laughs> only those touches that John Woo can bring to us, you know? Exactly. Um, and the funny thing, just another John Woo story. So my friend, who's a diehard John Woo fan, he's the guy that got me into a lot of the foreign films when I was younger and a lot of the Asian films and world cinema. Yeah. We saw the first John Woo movie I saw was Broken Arrow. And his cool. first reaction of Broken Arrow and Face Off and those type of movies were like, this motherfucker, he's stealing all his moves from his his you know is 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 Japanese stuff and he's just copying it like especially in Face Off where they have the scene with the seagulls and they fly into the air apparently that's ripped off from I think a Better Tomorrow or or Hard Boiled or something like that but yeah my buddy's like yeah, yeah you see this shit you see he's just taking he's stealing this directly from his earlier stuff so um but yeah anyway. I mean I mean look that's that's I mean, that's John Woo, you know, and no, so it it to, to bring it to bring it to like the U.S. audience and have the yeah, U.S. Yeah. audience go nuts over it, um, it. It's fun because then I'm sure your friend was like, oh, we've seen all this, you know. Yeah, you um, already watched the entire, you know, filmography, you know. It's great. <laughs> I go, I go off on these little tangents. I'm going to warn you every once in a while, Cupcake. My, Mike, yeah. Mike humors me. I'll start off with one thing and the next thing you know, I'm talking about three other films. <laughs> That's what I makes our it. show unique. That's what makes us unique. Yeah, I love but, uh, it. We love the tangents. Yes, we do. So she was in Mission Impossible. Another one uh, I was surprised by. She was in Girl Interrupted in '99 yeah. with you know Angela Angelina Jolie, and then uh, with Jack Nicholson in 2001 with The Pledge. So she has a really cool career. Um, this, listen, she just kills it in this role, man. She plays oh, yeah. the humpback, and like I said, I don't want to spoil too much. We'll talk about that. She plays this crazy obsessed nun with the hunchback, and man, she just does it, and she just goes for it. And you just you're just there for the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody in this really, like all the major supporting roles, everybody just goes for it. It's awesome. Uh, definitely, like yeah. you were saying, it, they all have that theatrical um, flair to the to the roles. Um, next is Michael Gaffar. He plays uh, Father Barr. Um, the big stuff people might have noticed him from, I didn't go into, again, I haven't gotten into his entire resume. I'm just touching on the pe films that people might remember seeing him in. Um, the big one is Life Force in 85 by Toby Hooper. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, believe it or not, in a Bond movie, uh, he was in For Your Eyes Only in 81. Um, yeah. So he's like one of these little supporting character actors that shows up here and there. He, he does great in this role. Um, we have Graham Armitage, who's playing, uh, hopefully I got that name right. Um, he's playing Louis the Eighth, and he was in The Boyfriend, uh, another obviously a Kurt, uh, excuse me, Ken Russell movie in seventy one. Ah, see, you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kurt Russell, Ken Russell. <laughs> I know, man, dude. I fumble with my words all the time, and it's even worse because we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't really edit this, so people get to see all my fumbling and all my my idiot mistakes. But it's all go good. I made I the same it, mistake. It, <laughs> it, it all adds it all part of the charm that's what i'm that's what i'm that's what i'm gonna use it's all part of the charm yep, exactly. um, so he was in that he was in a movie called going bananas in 87 and you know he's been a, in a bunch of other stuff but those are the two movies that again i think people might know him for in particular um next we have Gemma jones who plays madeline um who our main character will, will eventually marry um She's been in a bunch of stuff. She's been in uh, the movie Good that came out in 2008. Uh, that, guys, is an awesome underseen movie with uh, Viggo Mortensen. Um, yeah. It's a fantastic movie. Nobody talks about. She was in Harry Potter and the Chambers of uh, Secrets, which came out in 02. And surprisingly enough, she was in my Wicked Little Letters movie that, just, that I was just talking about earlier. 
Um, so she yep. kind of pops up all over the place. She's done a bunch of mainstream stuff. She's done a bunch of underground stuff and smaller films. She has a really nice little career. Um, next, we got Georgina Hale, uh, who plays the role of Philippe. Uh, Grand Air, we'll find out. You know, he ends up knocking her up. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she has a little role, but it's an interesting role. She was also in The Boyfriend. And this time I'm going to get it right. Ken Russell in 71. Um, she was in a movie that came out in 74 called Maller. Uh, she was also in Listomania in 75, another Ken Russell movie. And Valentino in 77. Um, yep. And then finally, rounding out the cast, we have Christopher Logue. Christopher Logue is playing Cardinal Richel, or Richel. I can't get my French words right, guys. Is um, it Rich, Richelieu, 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 I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm horrible with pronouncing things. I think me and uh, me and Troy might be tied for <laughs> the, the worst co-host when it comes, not worst co-host, but when it comes to pronouncing words, I'm like fucking horrible. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to school, guys. Um, oh, no, you're fine. You are fine. You're fine, John. <laughs> no, I, I have that self-deprecating sense of humor. I like to me poke too. fun at myself. Someone's got to do it, so it might as well be me. <laughs> um she was in or excuse me he was in jabberwocky in 77 another terry gilliam film which is of course a lot of fun um and a movie called the affair of the necklace that came out in 2001 with hillary swank it's another movie yeah. that i don't think a lot of people talk about but it was a really cool little movie um and that pretty much rounds out our main cast i don't think i missed any of the main cast i didn't go through everybody in the film i just thought i'd go through the people that i thought were relevant you know um so next I think, guys i think you hit all of them i i would just i think i would just mention um well two things one yeah sure Gemma jones this was her first feature after oh. um after a lot of television so okay. it's always like when i heard that that this was like her first role i mean granted she didn't have the role that the other woman had um, but it always brings to mind like thinking like Elizabeth Berkeley's first role was Showgirls, right? And it's like, yeah. wow, what a what a way to inaugurate yourself into the film world by having this something so controversial being your first film. Um, but the other person I wanted to mention was Murray Melvin as Father Mignon. Um, he has that sort of like severe Prince Valiant haircut. Um, and he's like just he's just crazy creepy looking like he looks like i don't know he's just he plays his part really well is what i'm trying to say yeah. um and i yeah i like i like murray melvin i think he's pretty he's cool. in barry he's in barry linden he kind of has a similar character role in that yeah basically and that that was that's what i was gonna say people probably yeah. know him most from from barry linden and then um i think he cropped up in um ugh, doctor who spinoff with the bisexual actor Torchwood. He showed Torchwood. up in um in Torchwood, yeah. So, oh, nice. Well, thank you for catching that because I tried to. I was trying to remember. You know, the, the crazy part is, guys, I'm so obsessive. I've watched this movie probably at least three times throughout the week, and I was still me too. I, I, I was, <laughs> I was, and I was still struggling trying to remember. Like I literally went through Wikipedia. I went through that one article I shared with you um, online that kind of got into a little bit of the facts, and I was still struggling to try to connect actors names character names trying to get the history right you know because mm -hmm. this movie certain movies like this movie's crazy it's over the top there's a lot going on but despite that it's still a real heavy hitter and there's so yeah. so much there's so much information in the movie and then there's so much information about the actual history i was like driving myself nuts trying to make sure i try to get it right you know what i mean so right yeah yeah no um, so I, I figured at this point, I'll just go a little bit into the history. I'm only going to touch on it. You know, like I said, if you guys are interested, I definitely re recommend checking out the book, um, by Al Lewis Huxley, The Devils of Luden. Um, it's based off that. It's basically a historical narrative of supposed demonic possession, religious fanaticism, uh, sexual repression and mass hysteria that took place in the small town of L Luden, excuse me. Uh, it centers on Roman, a Roman Catholic priest, Urban Grandier, and an entire convent of Ursuline nuns who allegedly became possessed by demons after Grandier made a pact with the devil, supposedly, 
These events led to several public exorcisms as well as executions by burning. Um, Irving Granier was burnt, a priest burned at the stake at Luton, France on August 18, 1634. Um, he was accused of seducing an entire convent of Ursuline nuns and of being in league with the devils. Uh, Grandier's, Grandier, excuse me, was likely promiscuous. Well, there's not likely on that. It's definitely, it's definitely, he was definitely promiscuous, that's for sure, and uh, was insolent towards his peers. Uh, he definitely had an attitude. Uh, he antagonized the mother superior, Sister Jean, um, when he rejected her advances. Um, he also rejected her offer to become the spiritual advisor to the convent. Uh, he was initially faced with a tribunal, um, and at first he was acquitted, um, but then uh, they went up and brought it up again. Um, and basically what happened was he spoke out against the Cardinal Richaud, uh, and that pissed him off. And because he did that, the Cardinal Richaud brought up a new trial, and from there he was ordered to be executed. Um, not only was he executed, he was executed, and I think most people would reasonably say in a really horrible way. Uh, he was tortured first uh, after being found guilty and executed by being burnt alive. Uh, the whole time, never admit to being guilty. Um, that's like, I know it's a very quick summary. There's a, like I said, the whole book would go into a lot more and there's a lot more you can pick up. Um, I don't want to bore our listeners with the entire history. I do think it's interesting. Um, I think what's interesting that a lot of people don't realize with the real history is that when you guys go to watch this movie, if you've never seen it, you're going to watch it more than likely and go, wow, it is over the top. It's grandiose. It's this big spectacle. But what's fascinating about this big spectacle is almost everything you see in that movie, as crazy as you may think, was actually based in truth, there's not a lot of exaggeration in the movie. There are a couple scenes, Mike's gonna talk about the story in a minute. There's a couple scenes that he'll mention for sure, obviously are done for, for the cinema. You're gonna, you're gonna take some alterations to the truth and change certain things, but the actual genuine real history was just as fucked up. Um, <laughs> it's, re it's, really, it's really nuts that it actually matches the craziness of the film that what you're actually seeing on the screen is real history. Because usually when directors, writers, they take something that's based off a true story, they take licenses to make it more dramatic, to make it more interesting, to kind of fill in the gaps and get people's interest. This real history was so screwed up. You didn't have to do that at all. I mean, you, you <laughs> do that, of course. But it's so fucked up. You, you just you could you could have had a documentary doc, you know, talking about what went on, and you still would have been like, "What the fuck," you know. Um, so with all that said, I will turn this over next to our boy Mike here, and Mike, you can go ahead and if you wouldn't mind talking about the story, that would be awesome. Yeah. So I'm I'm uh, basically I'm right up here. I'm going to read about the story, the plot summary. I'm also going to ask you guys some questions as we go through this and kind of get your opinion because uh, there's there's a lot to go over here. And then uh, uh, at the end, I'll kind of give my opinions and go to you to kind of give your opinions on what you thought, how the movie affected you, and then we'll finish it up. Okay, so The Devils. The film opens up with a gala-like flamboyant performance introducing, introducing us to this hedonistic imp who we find out is the King Louis XIII. And he is there with the evil Cardinal Richelieu. You feel like you're a Richelieu. I don't know how we said that, but we feel like uh, when you're entering into this world or entering into a very gaudy theatrical world, something that right from the get-go, the film paints for you. Well, the story goes that uh, they decide at this point to, during this big spectacle performance and introduction, they're going to combine their powers of the church and state together to take over the 17th century France. At this time, they, uh, the cardinal wanted to go after the Protestants and basically going through every single town, town by town, to get rid of and kill and destroy all Protestants. 
The king tells the cardinal that, well, he can go town to town, but he's made a deal with the governor of the town of Lorden or Luden and tells the cardinal to leave them alone. Of course, the cardinal, the red, the red, I called him, he doesn't like that. Uh, Cupcake, what did you think about this introduction to this world and having, like me, this being the first time watching it, what did, what kind of, did it remind you of or where did it bring you when you first saw this first intro scene? So my first immediate thought was, the king was that gay, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but but just first of first of all, you know, I had seen the film and then discovered, obviously, in the credits that Derek Jarman was the production designer. And watching that first sequence, I'm I'm like, of course, Derek Jarman was the production designer because it's <laughs> pure Derek Jarman. Um, yeah. But the thing that struck me was. Um, I didn't I didn't realize and apparently this is based in fact he would he would put on these plays and he would oh. act in them like that was his big thing and yeah. obviously back then there were no there were no female actors so all the males played the female parts but what I found striking about that that first scene um is when it flashes on Cardinal Richelieu watching it He's also surrounded by men dressed as women, but they're also cavorting with each other. And I'm sort of like, wait a minute, I don't understand what's happening here. Like, was he that out? Was all of that stuff happening there? But but what I loved about the way that the, the sequence ends is he, Russell perfectly visualizes and sets up this conspiracy between the church and the state, basically, to commit all of these horrible acts and drive out Protestants or other people and sort of like take over. And there's this great part where he kisses Richelieu's like ring and then the camera just kind of like pans in and then suddenly we get the credits and everything. And it's so sinister and yet totally telegraphs. These are the two enemies that are going to set like all of this in motion. I, I loved it. It's a great introduction and it really just, it introduces you not only to the villains, but it also introduces you to the style that we're going to get throughout if you aren't used yeah. to uh, Ken Russell's style. So right. then we cut to the cold calculated white walls and massive set pieces uh, that we learned so much about earlier on, some of the biggest in um, Hollywood history up to that point. What we do get is an introduction of uh, priest father Urban Grandior, uh, Grandier. He comes in almost like the Beatles coming back to London after taking America by storm and the nuns are screaming and losing their minds as if they're seeing the biggest superstar of all time as we discussed the priest comes in with this almost sexuality that it just kind of oozes from within who he is as father grandier comes in of course one of the uh, sisters um, has images of him as like a jesus figure what we do find out is that some of these nuns are suffering from undiagnosed mental health issues and ptsd from taking care of the many villagers who are dying from the black Black, pel black plague. Some of these women have lots of mental health issues, such as schizophrenia, some birth defects, some other issues. Um, but here, Father Grandier, who's played, has this kind of natural sexual magnetism and an arrogance to him that puts him above everybody as he walks into the town. His ego, however, allows him to gleefully spit in the face of the oaths and promises that he took as a priest. This leads his town and monastery to be ran more like a respected godfather type figure than a loving Christ type priest. What probably didn't help the mental health of the nuns was the sounds of all the sinful fortification of Father Grandier as he had regular affairs with at least one young girl he is teaching Latin to. He happened to get her pregnant, but nonetheless, he wasn't raised the child he was going to make sure he found a young man to raise the child for her again to me this showed a lot about the narcissism and painting forth these first couple scenes paint an image of what was going on not only in the world during the dark ages but what was happening with men they could come in with this kind of era and this aura and again like we see it now more than ever is we see a lot of toxic masculinity coming from the priests coming from the the uh, father and uh, the Cardinal Richelieu, as well as the king. So all of these rulers have almost a narcissism to them, this kind of overtly ruling um, power that really is shown throughout the film. 
what did you think, um, John, when you saw the way that these big, cold, calculated white walls and the way that the set design was when we actually got to Wooden? What did I think about the, the set designs or the, the, the characters? I mean, from a technical perspective, it was beautifully shot. And uh, like you met, both mentioned, it looked amazing. Um, if we're talking about the set designs, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was gorgeous. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was very, very, very striking. You know, um, like I know I'd spoken with you earlier, Mike, and, you know, uh, before this film, not story wise, but the only comparison I can make to this film would be to compare in some ways to cl a Clockwork Orange, like as far as all the, the intense, like when that came out, the shock people had and the craziness. And the, and the scope of it. Um, the, the only difference is obviously that film was able to get a physical release without any issues and mm -hmm. people were a little more accepting of it. I mean, they, ex they had issues with it, but this film definitely, it had a, its uphill battle and understandably so based off some of the stuff you see in the film. So. Yeah. Well, these nuns, um, as we see in the town of Luden, uh, they are portrayed as young, disturbed, and most of them are portrayed as sexually deprived. They almost sound like a group of hounds baying and lusting after Urban as he entered into the town. Um, yeah. and we find out that the governor has died and the priest has now usurped the power. Meanwhile, during this, uh, we found the power-hungry entourage of Cardinal and King Louis' men seek to take control. And uh, the Cardinal now uh, wants to destroy Father Grandier who he runs the fortified town in the monastery of Wudan, kind of like a pimp, protecting his block of sex workers. Again, he uses his sexuality to control all the women around him with equal amounts of love and admiration, as well as heaps of gaslighting and coercion to the females he surrounds himself with. Father Grandier uses his power, charm, charisma, and sexuality to woo everyone. And of course, the town comes together, and they are able to push the king's men away, and demanded that they not return until he sees the king himself, demanding that he knows that the king has, again, said that this town should be destroyed and taken apart. This is when we get, begin to see the Father Grandier as a more sympathetic character. At this point is when I started to see a, a little bit of change in him from the kind of great leader and grandiose chauvinist to someone who actually cares as a caring pro pro protector over the ruthless way that France is being ran. And one thing in a scene specifically that really threw me off is he walks in and we see a naked, I'm guessing a nun or, or someone getting um, basically it looks like abuse in this kind of alchemist type way where they've got all of these weird experiments and basically the father comes in and he's like stop doing all of this no more i don't want any of this any of this and he starts naming all these weird kind of snake oils that he's basically doing to try to heal these women of basically what we know as ptsd and them just not being taken care of um uh, I guess I'll go to uh, Jose. Well, what did you think about some of the portrayals of mental health and the way that these, um, I don't know what you call them, alchemists kind of treated that? Well, I think, so, you know, I think what struck me too was, first of all, the plague is happening, right? So it's kind of like, sure. ooh, are they going crazy from the plague or, or what have you? Um, but, you know, the church... Some religions sometimes, you know, rail against, say, evolutionism or even medicines, right? And so oh. you have to, you uh, modern medicine and modern, you know, chemicals and drugs and things like that. So, you know, looking looking back at the dark ages and how this went, obviously, you know, I think one of the things about the film that's so powerful is the hypocrisy of not only the church, but state institutions, the hypocrisy of the institutions that will tell you in public, you know, you must be pious, you must, you know, be virginal, you must be nice. And yet everybody knows. That was the other thing that was sort of weird about, about, I love your rock star analogy about um, Grandier because like, yeah, everybody, everybody wants to fuck him um, and have sex with him. And everybody knows this is what he does. Right. And yet nobody does anything about it or complains about it it just it's weirdly accepted but that's this whole hypocrisy of you know do do as i say not as i do um yeah. but but you know the church it's interesting that there's 
you don't really see like the the doctor profession it's just these like ghoulish men covered in dirt with their with their rubber aprons you know like that scene with the on ggtmc we often talk about like dummy deaths or whatever this is the yeah. first i've ever seen of like a dummy crocodile death he yeah. the woman yeah. appears to be lying on like a crocodile and oliver reed is like oh get this crocodile out of there and oh. clearly it's a dummy crocodile yeah. and he throws it out the window and as if that wasn't bad enough there's a sword fight where he uses the dummy crocodile right. yeah. as like defense and so it's like what what's going on but just the nature of like the leeching or putting the hornet on the woman's nipple and having her bitten. Um, yeah. It just makes you, makes you think, God, we have advanced as a society where I don't have to have, I don't have to get bitten by a crocodile to be cured of something. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole mental health aspect of it was very disturbing in a way because it almost seemed like, Oh, they're crazy and you can't marry them because they're too ugly. So let's just make them a nun. <laughs> right. You know, let's bring it's, the lab and experiment a little bit. Come here. What, what do we got? Right. Actually, there's a crazy theory, by the way, uh, that, that the granary where they made the bread from at this, at this nunnery, the Ursuline convent, mm -hmm. that it, there might've been a type of mold in it that they weren't oh. even aware of that they were cooking and consuming and this mold can cause hallucinations. So that that's a one of the going theories as to why all of the women, not just a few, were going nuts. Yeah. Well, yeah. that perfectly sets us up right into where we're at. Where at this point, um, at this point in the story, Father Grandier is at direct odds with the king's men, who of course he kicked out of town. Uh, and at this point, they've came up with a plan to destroy him, as we talked about setting him up as a warlock, kind of making it seem as if he's a warlock in control of this devil possessed nunnery. Well, unaware that the neurotic hunchback, uh, hunchback sister, uh, Jean de Agnes, uh, the abbess of the local Ursuline Covenant, is sexually obsessed with him, uh, the priest goes off and falls in love with and elopes with the local girl. Sister Agnes, enraged now that the father left and, and didn't stay to run the, the Christly duties, she confesses to the new priest in charge that she was raped and abused by the father Grandier, and the new priest believes she may be possessed. The cardinal's men then come up with this wonderful idea to hire a fucking mad, insane witch hunter who is brought in to gather evidence against the priest and begins to brainwash and graphically torture these nuns to the extreme, including boiling hot douches, forced vomiting, lots more of yike scary stuff that I have not seen on film before. The already disturbed nuns who are tortured and driven mad by the men and the witch hunt go on a naked tirade, unleashing all their un or all their un un inhibitions, including, which I saw the version of, raping a statue of Jesus in a large orgy gone wild, like a group think rage fuck, masquerading as demon possessions. Now, I unknowingly ended up watching a a uh, version of the film that's a fan cut that takes edited version edited bits of that rape of jesus and puts it back into the film and i guess they did a really good job of making it s sound well they could clean up only as much as they could but some of that stuff was really disturbing john what did you think about some of the imagery during this scene and how did it uh, affect your love or like of the story at this point so did you feel i'm it was gonna necessary? i'm gonna go back a little bit i want to touch base a little bit on you, the scene you talked about earlier, one step back with the with Grandier. Um, first of all, I think Grandier. Most people will agree he was a flawed person, definitely a little bit of an asshole, and definitely a little bit of a narcissist. But people have to understand, as far as the context of the time, being a man whore to quote to quote Deuce Gigolo <laughs> or Deuce Bigelow, you know. It, it was a it was a pretty common thing. So I think that's one thing I do think is important. I think beyond that, he was still a narcissist and a bit of an asshole, but I don't think he was this uh this evil person that he's made out or demonized to be. Now as far as the imagery goes, um I think the way it was shot was absolutely beautiful and striking um i do think and i'm a crazy person and i love that wacky over the top like nasty violence i think it's done incredibly well 
I do think some of it, and, and the key word there is some of it, might be taking it a tad bit too far. Um, so I do understand why there were certain choices made in the editing department to leave certain things out. Mm -hmm. But I here's here's what I will say. I do think even the stuff that they put back in with the, in the version that you're talking about, because I saw that version as well, even the stuff that they put back I, in, I do think is effective. And, and I think, I don't know, this is just my personal thoughts when it comes to filmmakers, writers, creators. I think you have to be able to put your vision out there. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, love it or hate it, you, you, you can't control that, you know? And I am never a fan of someone slapping the hand and going, nope, 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 you can't do this. You got to take this out. I think it, the minute you hire someone, like an auteur, versus a gun for hire type of director, you have to trust in their vision and what they're going to do for better or worse, or just hire a gun for hire. Um, yeah. So while I do think some of the images were maybe a, a tad bit too much, I still think they were effective um, and they were so well done. They really were. I mean, mm -hmm. this movie, uh, like uh, Jose, you mentioned, the photography is beautiful, uh, you know, the way that he set up his shots was amazing. And um, there's just some really effective storytelling going on um, among all the craziness of the movie. There's just some really effective storytelling to drive home the point of what they're they're trying to get across. Um, so I guess that's the very long extended way of no, answering no. the question, Mike. <laughs> no, I just like, I just like while we're going through this story, I kind of, because this, the film to me is so much about the visuals. I kind of want to ask, I'm yeah, going through the story to ask how, how you felt about the visuals. As no, well as I, the story. I appreciate that you did. Yeah. So we're going, continuing on while all this is happening. Uh, everything that's going on with the nuns, father Grandier is off in love. He's eloped begins to feel uh, guilty for his gaslighting and womanizing past. We kind of see him become almost like an Ebenezer Scrooge type character. Once he gets back to the village, he's feeling different. He's made, felt like he's made changes, but when he arrives, of course, he's arrested and charged with witchcraft, raping one of the nuns and ruling them like a demonic priest, ruining a coven of witches. Of course, none of this is true. Um, the supposed trial is like a theatrical witch hunt where they torture and shave Father Grandier because he won't admit to being a warlock. They do things like um, bash into his knees, break his arm, his legs. Anyway, they continue to torture him in awful, vile ways. Um, he's found guilty. At this point, he feels pretty bad for the way he's used women. And because he found love, he now feels, you know, this awful way. And he, at the same time, is not going to admit to what he's done. He does feel guilt for the, for the way that he's treated uh, the women and the people around him and the way he's usurped power. While not being admitting guilt for being a warlock or possessed, he screams for God's forgiveness and demands God's justice as he is being burned alive. As the film ends, the town is blown up while he is burning and the villagers run for their lives. The next day, the priest's dead remains are scoured and a burned femur bone is found and given to the insane nun who uses it to gleefully masturbate while the real love of his life leaves the town that is now smoke and rubble and walks away into a vast wasteland of nothing of hanging dead protestants and that is the end of the devils so gentlemen what did you all think about it um and i guess we'll go back to me and i'll finish it up and give you my opinion but cupcake what did you think about the film overall First of all, that femur bone, my immediate reaction was it looks like a penis. And sure enough. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough. Um, so this is this is the this is the first time that I have ever seen this. Um, Randy, Randy had always been like, you should come over and we'll just like watch it or whatever. But then I, I learned that there were different cuts. And so I was really kind of like confused. Like, do I do I track something down? Do I get something? Do I get something? Uh, what do I do? You know? And um, the first time that I watched this, I remember just feeling like the last quarter of it was just so loud and cacophonous and there's there's boobies and pubic hair everywhere. And, and then, you know, Oliver Reed's being tortured. And I just, I was like, I don't think I can get through this. And <laughs> so then- I was um, like, that fucking John, what did he do? What is he making me watch this? 
I mean, uh, but, but you know, we, we had mentioned, uh, John had mentioned before that he had seen it three times, uh, before this recording. And I actually went through and I watched it again and I was able to make it through. And then I watched it a third time just to be like, am I picking up all of this stuff? And, and so what really struck me was how, even though this is an incident from history, and uh, it was made in the 70s about just how a lot of the themes and what uh, Russell is saying about the human condition is very relevant today. So, I mean, let's just let's just start with the whole human condition thing. I mean, obviously, you know, the Catholic Church has a lot of controversy. It's now coming out that that instead of what many would say doing the right thing and just excommunicating these abusers and um you know people that um and we're not even just talking like sexual abuse we're also talking about like money people stealing money and this and that or whatever rather than just excommunicating them they simply shuffled them around for them to commit more of these atrocities um yeah yeah unfortunately and but i bring all of that up to say that you know People who commit themselves to a life of religion, like um, Urban Grandier, like the nuns at the convent, they're still human beings. And so they, I think what's strong about this movie, although albeit in a very theatrical and, and exaggerated way, is that, you know, they're still human beings dealing with human things like desire, like, um, you know, wondering what the grass is like, you know, if they had not chosen the religious life and then dealing with that conflict. And, um, you know, we're given this sort of parallel storytelling juxtaposition of how each of the characters treats this conflict in them, you know? So we've got this woman who's very virginal, who wants to give herself and feels true love to Grandier. And then we've got the woman who is one of his, women that he slept with who now feel scorned because he's like, oops, our affair is over. You're pregnant. Sorry. And then, you know, it, it's kind of like hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned. Right. And then yeah. with, with Grandier, you know, he has his proclivities just like French, the French King does right. The French King dresses as a woman and parades around and does all of this stuff. Um, you know, but but he's in a position of power where people can't really tell him don't do this kind of thing. Yeah. And um, what I what what I also found was very interesting was this power dynamic, not only between the church and the state, but you can look to our current political climate and you can see, well, I'm not going to be able to get rid of him the way that I should using mm -hmm. councils to vote him out or or what have you. So what can we do? We can cast him out as this amoral villain who is possessed and everybody will completely buy it because we'll just have this campaign of disinformation and stuff like that. And so that's that's one of the things that I kind of came away with which was, mm -hmm. you know, um you know, this I this notion of using a witch hunt as a cover to get rid of a political enemy. And so yeah. you can get more power, you know? Um, and what I think is ultimately interesting about the Grandier character is he starts out as sort of like this rock star who is on a self-destructive trajectory. And he says things like, well, I do all these things because I want people to come after me and I want to destroy myself to him realizing look, there is this political witch hunt against me, but our community can be something greater. And then he changes. He decides yeah. he wants to have a life with this woman and then he gets killed for it. Um, he's not a, he's not an angel. He's not a saint. Um, no, like, absolutely. you know, no, no one else is, but those are the things that struck me about this. And so even if you dial back all of the crazy imagery, um, there's still a really potent story and a theme and a char and character arcs in that. Um, mm. uh, but just the way that it's been told visually, I should also say that the, the idea of the, the, the nuns sort of 
you know, flinging off their clothes and doing all of this stuff. Again, it's this hiding behind an idea of something, right? And so it's like, it's like the witch hunter says, you know, oh, they're possessed. They can't help themselves. What if they could? And they were just like, you know what? I am possessed. Here you That's go. It. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to fling my clothes off and do whatever the fuck I want because I possess, I possess. Right. And it's yeah. the same way that the politicians are like, well, we're going to get rid of him and just say he's possessed. Um, you know, so that's going to give us license to come in and destroy your city and jail people and burn people alive. So it's, it's very compelling and intriguing, but it's also scary because we're seeing this repeated again and again and again, and it's happening now. Right. I mean, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, the, the orange one is like, it's all a witch hunt. <laughs> it's all a political, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's scary and i i love that you guys made me watch this and finally <laughs> track down a way to watch it because it's probably one of my favorite movies and probably a great filmic achievement um from ken russell so yeah, yeah. i yeah. loved it myself john um here i'll finish it up i'll give my opinions and then john we'll finish with you giving your opinions yeah sorry i was like ah. no you did great you're awesome <laughs> you're, you're, you put it together well man mine's gonna be a lot shorter than that but yeah, that's, you, you know, that's, that's you who i great. am but no you were awesome you really you were did great. A great job. thank you honestly i for me um when i first watched the movie i i i hated father grandier i went to john i was like dude fuck this guy i do not like him like i and then it took me like i watched it three times it took me um by the time, well, I watched it two and then a half. But my second full time, I saw the arc and I saw the Ebenezer Scrooge type of arc on it. And I was like, oh, this was what was he was trying to do all along. And then, like you said, he talks about these things like he doesn't care anymore about what people think about him. He was on a rock star trajectory. And I think that's what we were supposed to see because he was seeing that his life was actually kind of better having sex and living this life without all of these sexual repressions and rules. And he was leading his town. They seemed like they were happy people. Again, the sexual repression, I think, goes back to why the nuns did everything that they did. And I think the big messages are don't mix church and state, and we shouldn't be sexually repressing anybody. And I think that those are given 100% right from the get-go. Visually, yeah. the film smacks you in the face so hard the first watch that I just was jaw-dropped. And by the time it was all over and I got to that femur scene, I was like, what the fuck? This is just like a mind fuck of ultimate proportions and by the time it was all said and done by my first watch i was like i loved it visually i gotta stick more to the story and then john mm -hmm. kept saying no it's all about the story and so when i watched it again the story made more sense i started to see the conniving i started to see the power plays and yeah a little bit of um a little bit of game of the thrones uh game of thrones per se so the story does come forth stronger after you get used to the visuals and the visual style and the theatricality and godliness of it all the story really is there the screenplay is there the dialogue is great for what it was yeah. overall this is a fucking it's probably the best movie we've watched so far on this show and i don't it is one that more people need to see and the version that now, of course, the question comes, what kind of what type of version, what are you going to watch? Try to stay away from the cut version that was on Shutter. I think that the American R rated cut, what I found and what I posted on our site was a pretty cool experiment. It's like a basically they took all of the cuts that they found as well as took footage from a documentary of the scenes of the rape of Christ that uh, actually was taken out of the film and they sliced that back into it. So the version I saw, the first version I saw had all that stuff in it. And of course you could see it in the different cuts. Like it was almost vhs -y when it went to that, uh, the things that Russell took out and I could see why he took it out. I don't think you need to run to that scene to see the, the rape of Christ scene. It, mm. it, I think it's too much. So I think that taking that out is fine. But if you can see as much as you can, like I was talking to John, I think all of the imagery is necessary. A lot of this is necessary for you to understand the world that they were living in and how crazy the fucking dark ages really were. So as a period piece, as a, a gaudy, weird theatrical experience, I loved it. And yeah easily the best thing we've watched so far on the show so oh, yeah, sure. what'd you so think was, john 
Oh, go so ahead. wait, before, before we get to John, I was just, I was just going to say in a way. Um, so one of my favorite lines from um, the movie Wolf with Michelle Pfeiffer and Jack Nicholson is um, he goes, she tries to tear him down. And then he mm-hmm. goes on this whole tirade about um, judging her basically. And he says, you know, yeah. in a way you're your own worst enemy, right? It, in a way. I, and you know, this just echoes what Mike had said, what I had said, which was yeah. watching it the first time was so exhausting that in a way, Russell is his own problem because, yeah. you know, I, I think that if he had maybe presented it in a more traditional manner at, with the same shocking elements in some ways that people might have gotten into it and this and that. But because Russell is that way, it yeah. would definitely turn people off. He's sort of his own problem. But yeah. watching it again, it all of the things just become more clear so yeah. I just wanted to put that out there. That no, I, I you think know. I think I think even like when I saw it, because I saw it a year ago for the very first time. But obviously, having not seen it since then up until recently, I think that first viewing, it's it definitely you're just like, what? And it's like not a bad <laughs> what, but it, it's like oh my god, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't matter how many crazy like films you've seen, you're just like holy fucking shit. But I think it's one of those movies that. The first viewing, like you said, Mike, I'll, I'll just go straight, I guess, into what I think. Yeah. Well, like you like you said, the very first time I saw it, I noticed that the visual striking stuff. Um, I come at it from a, with the story perspective, like so like contextually, obviously, like both of you guys said, there are some priests out there doing some horrible things, just like in the rest of the world. There are people out there doing horrible things. Um, the Catholicism in general, like I'm. I would say not to go too deep into it. I would say I'm agnostic if I were to identify myself as anything more than anything. I believe in the concept of something bigger than myself, um, but not necessarily subscribe to one religion. But I grew up through most of my childhood as as a Catholic. Um, I think that said, the way Catholicism has it set up to be a priest, and I, I'm not saying this excuses any behavior, but they have this idea that you can't date you can't get married. The whole concept being is that if you did that, you would always put your partner before the greater good of the people. So that's, I guess, their logic behind it. I don't necessarily agree with that because there are many Christian religions and even non-Christian religions that still allow their fathers and uh, uh, reverends to have a life, have kids, have a marriage, and have all those things that are important to most people. Um, so I think that plays a part when you keep it in contextually as far as like, I'm not saying like like we all said, he went through, like you guys said, the journey of the Scrooge. But I think like when he goes through that journey in the beginning, and like I said, he is he's having sex with the, the girl that she's probably in her late teens, you know, and he knocks her up and he has this whole attitude about it. And then you know, he falls in love with this girl. He finally meets the right one. And there's all this crazy sex stuff going on. And it's like, from the perspective of like modern day human being, you're like, okay, he's fucking some teenage girl. Come on. Like, dude, you're, that's fucked up. You know, like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And then he's having the, he's having a romantic love with this this woman, you know? And again, you're like, hey, you're a priest. Why are you doing this? But like, again, what you guys both touched on as far as, you especially jose you know you touched on the idea at the end of the day we're human beings you know no matter how much you can give your your life to a greater purpose or or a greater good you still have human needs and human desires um i think it's i think it's just a really interesting story i think it's a really good journey as we watch what's going on you're seeing his journey you're seeing this sister jean i mean let, let's face this this lady i mean yeah she might have been poisoned by the grains she might have had this fucked up stuff going on but this this lady she basically was like this hater man she was this chick that was like oh well he's not gonna he's not gonna accept my advances he's not gonna give me the time of day and let me be his plaything. well i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna accuse him of being a fucking warlock i mean she was the one that really instigated things um when our witch hunter came into town she was the one that went up to him and said hey listen this guy, he's uh, he just got married. He's not supposed to be doing that. That's a big no-no. He's a he's a Catholic priest. He's not supposed to be doing that. He's not supposed to be having sex. Like so, 
that character, oh man, she's a she's a handful. She was definitely uh, very grating, and uh, as she was supposed to be. Um, and that they all have their own little journeys. Um, each little character, I mean, they're little mini journeys, but you really get inside their head, their perspective, and understand, or maybe not agree with, but understand, like, wow, you know. Um, I think it just really all coalesces to a really just a fine film. It's an amazing film. And, and I really do think, um, I really do think it's, it's unfortunate only in the sense though, in the sense that it has been presented and it has been released in the cut versions, yeah. um, but it's never got its due. It's yeah. never got its due as a proper release. And I know I discussed with you, Mike, before we, we recorded while we were waiting for Jose to come on. This is one of those movies. If they were to turn it over to um, Indicator or Our or Vinegar Syndrome or Draft House and just give them every piece of material they have and have like a like a sixty dollar release, four K release that has all the different versions, that has the documentary that you can find on YouTube and online. Mm -hmm that has all this stuff and just did a remastering like they do with the Criterion films. I don't know how many people would buy this for me. It oh, would be, yeah. an, it would, it would be an instant buy. And I try not to, I try to be careful with my money. I don't spend a lot of money on these like 40, $50 editions of movies nowadays. I'm poor. I try to be very careful <laughs> with my money, but this is, but this is one of those movies, man. Like, I don't know anyone that's seen it and hasn't had some sort of reaction to it. And it would, it would make a killing. It's yeah. just it's just fucking Warner Brothers, and for whatever reason they they're just too afraid to pull the trigger on it. You know what I mean? It's like Disney, with you know, and they have a more justified reason. But it's like Disney with Song of the South, right? We understand why they're never going to pull the trigger on that release, but you know what I mean? In this, in the same token, they're both some of the behaviors that you would be in awe and shock of, and some of the mentality is also contextually. You got to remember, it's part of that might be something we're not proud of of that time period in history but it's all contextually one can argue that that's just the way unfortunately a certain part of our population thought at that period in time and behaved in that period of time doesn't absolve them of the behavior or the way they acted or thought but it was a product of the way unfortunately some people were so i guess my long drawn out rambling there guys <laughs> kind of tells you a little bit how i feel about the film I definitely highly recommend it. And like I said, hopefully one day Warner Brothers will pull their heads out of their asses and they'll give some company the rights to actually put out a beautiful release of it because it definitely deserves it. It deserves hey, a you good know what? release. Yep. Yeah, Go it totally deserves a good release. Maybe, maybe we could or your listeners could write David Zaslav over, yeah. at, uh, <laughs> over at Warner Brothers and say, hey, listen, don't write off bad girl or or coyote versus acme why don't yeah. you redo the devils and release it and you'll get some profits that way <laughs> yeah that's true well, freaking jerk dude, I, dude, you don't know how pissed off i was i'm such a kid at heart i love my favorite like warner brother cartoon like as far as the characters go i love roadrunner and i love wiley coyote so yes. when they wrote that one off i was so upset i, I was because so they heartbroken had, they and they even teased us they even teased us that it might get distribution because once the story hit, they were like, oh, maybe we'll do it. Maybe. Nope. Nope. They wrote it off. I was yeah. uh, heartbroken. So yeah. sad. And, and, and from what I understand, you know, we're going off on a tangent talking about that, but, uh, but th that film actually tested well with audiences because they did mm -hmm. test screenings and, and it wasn't, it wasn't like a $200 million film. I think the budget on that was like maybe 75 or 80 million, which is, you no, know, I, I realize it's a lot of money, but not when you have like fucking, what the last Indiana Jones movie was like 350 million. The last fucking Fast and the Furious that movie, was never going to make money million. back. Yeah, never going <laughs> to yeah. make the money back. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, once you start talking 300 million dollars, doesn't matter how well you sell. It's just yeah. not. It's not. Gonna Although well, I think be very difficult to. Oh yeah, I think that Warner Brothers though. I think they day and dated the live action cartoon um the mix of uh tom and jerry and i think that was not a success and so they thought like Mer. but you know yeah. listen that's like comparing apples and oranges right roadrunner and coyote is so different from tom and jerry yeah so anyway yeah, and, well, and, and, and the reality is let's face it guys you, i don't know when the movie theaters by you guys but i have an amc we don't have a lot of art theaters around here but even like some of the big movies 
I've gone to like, and I usually I'm an old man. So I, I like the early morning showing so I can go or the afternoon showing. So maybe I'm just going at the wrong time, but even the ones that you think would be popular, I go into and there might only be 30 people. That's the most I've seen in a movie theater in two years. I haven't been to a yeah. movie theater where, where I've walked in and it's been all 200, 300 seats are sold out. So it doesn't matter whether you have a small mu- budget, small budget movie, a mid budget movie, an indie movie, or a $300 million movie. What these studios need to understand is no matter what, you're always going to be tossing the dice. You're always mm-hmm. going to be taking a right. chance. Nothing's a sure thing. Even the, the you know, I, I'm not overly fond of it, but even the last Fast and Furious movie, you would think it was the ninth movie. Even that movie lost money. But that was the what, yeah. what the reason I, the only reason I bring it up is that was that franchise had always made money, made money. But that sequel took a dip when it came to the what it, what it did at the box office. So even a yeah. even a movie that has that built in audience sometimes doesn't always do. You you can't predict it. You know what I mean? It's true. You can only you can throw thirty million into advertising, but that still doesn't mean that you're going to be guaranteed a hit. You know? Yeah. So. The point of my rambling again is take a chance, damn it. <laughs> Roll the dice. Yeah, the devil needs to be seen, definitely. It oh, needs yeah. to be seen. It needs oh. to be out there. There's so many things to play to today. I mean, the, the definitely the sexual deprivation stuff, even the kink. The kink yeah. in her back and that whole that whole sequence where she where the, the Agnes is like dreaming that she's in love and she has a sexual relationship with the priest. And then when she goes to get him and he doesn't want her, she gets this big that's when the big growth on her back comes. It's like her sexual depravity and her wanting of sex is that grossness and it, and it yeah. sucks because i was raised lds you were raised that if you touch yourself like mormon basically yeah. that if you even touch yourself or do anything like that you're going straight to hell it's as bad as murder so it's well, like what yeah. the yeah. crap because i would have been in hell a long time ago Mark. right <laughs> so it's like <laughs> the film needs to be seen because I've we been... live in a day and age where so many people have been raised by some kind of sexual trauma because of yeah. religion religion yeah. fucks up a lot of people because we all have yeah. some kind of trauma sexually of some sort because religion believes that we should be abstinent again this yeah. priest wasn't a bad guy but he was breaking yeah. the quote-unquote rules which of course yeah. the nun had to oh god forbid she hear him have sex and all this caused this big fervor all again comes down to those two things which i think are the most important takeaways the mixing of church and state as a no-no yeah. and we shouldn't deprive adults of sexuality we should yeah, yeah, period. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, the other the other thing that I think is also pol- politically relevant now also is just this like weaponizing things that used to be looked at as beneficial or good, like organized religion, like social media, and then turning it against us so that they the three percent or the people in power can get what they want. Like that is wholly relevant. In fact, they're um after the proclamation in this movie, after the proclamation is issued that the that they want to tear down Loudon, um, uh, Grandier has this big speech in the town square, and he says something along the lines of, "Whenever there is a nationalist like fervor or movement, you know they're coming for your country." And to subjugate you uh, again, I'm I'm paraphrasing the line, but he even says nationalist. He says it mm-hmm. absolutely nationalist, and that is so what's taking over the GOP right now is this sort of nationalist movement um, mixed in with a little bit of a uh, Christian fundamentalism that wants to bomb us all back to like 1960s when women were in the kitchen, and if you got pregnant, oh well, you got pregnant, you don't yeah, get an abortion, well. you know, and um and uh you know men are making all the decisions for everybody else you know this it's it's creepy and i think if more people saw stuff like this um they would maybe think twice about those things so yeah well any movement that says uh you know what tells you tells you as a person that that what to do with your body can go fuck themselves you know what i mean let's face it yeah yeah i I feel exactly the same way (laughs) You know, I, I don't care what you do with your life or how you live your life. At the end of the day, as long as you're happy and you're kind to me, I'll be kind to you. That's always been my philosophy as a human being. You live your life the way you want to and be a good person. That's it. Treat yeah. up. You know, the thing that we're taught as kids, treat people the way you want to be treated, you know? And these people that are hammering this bullshit home, it's like you forgot that basic tenement that most of us learned when we were kids, you know what I mean? Like you can believe in whatever religion you want, 
I draw the line when you're knocking at my door at Sunday morning and it's eight o'clock in the morning and you're trying to sell me your religion. Because if, yeah. if, if you love your religion that much and it's so wonderful, you don't need to go pushing it. You know what I mean? You can believe right. in it. And that, that's awesome that you believe in it and you have that connection to it. You believe in something that's great. But if you have to sell it, there's something going wrong here. If you have to sell it, if you have to push it on yeah. people, if you have to yep. tell people. I remember someone I worked with years ago told me, oh, you're going to go to hell because you don't go to church every Sunday. I'm like, what? Get the fuck no. out of here. You're no, like no. That, that, that like small minded mentality. But like but like Crazy. you said, there there's a part of our nation that unfortunately they have maybe similar echoes. They have that idea of like, hey. You don't believe in what I believe in. You're not doing what I think is moral. Then you're going to go to get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? It's just, it's horrible. And I um, think that, you know, regardless of whatever quote unquote side yeah. you're on or whatever your belief yeah. is, yeah. no one likes to be told what to do. No. So, you know, no. that is uh that is a very human yeah. condition thing. Nobody likes to be told what to do. So no, it's that small mind of thinking. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it was a great episode. Definitely. Cup yeah, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have you on again. Like I, you, when that special edition of Caligula comes out later on this year, <laughs> we're hitting I it. can't wait. We're, I can't wait. I love that movie. <laughs> and I promise, I promise, we'll have you back on for an episode that doesn't involve that much hedonism. We'll, we're gonna, we're gonna bring yes. in like a, a something where it won't be as intense. You can actually have a normal episode. You mean no femur dildos and possessions? <laughs> well, I mean, if you really want, we could probably. I, mean, I don't know. Femur dildos is kind of a hard. That's a hard film to. That's a hard niche. I'm sure it's out there in other films somewhere. But you know, we, we might have I'm going to contact a here. couple companies. I think I think they could make a fortune on femur dildos. <laughs> femur. That's a band name right there. Femur dildos. Um, <laughs> I can only imagine. Oh <laughs> uh, well Jose oh thank you so much for being yes. a part of our show we might as well wrap yes. it up we're already at like two hours here I Go know. Ahead, John. Let's that's wrap great it up. though you we love those episodes right thank you so much for having me both oh, of you cool. uh this has been this has been great I love it I loved yeah, it so what we're gonna do now guys is we're gonna remember first uh, announce our next movie our next movie we're gonna be talking about uh Andrew Garfield's tick tick boom it's on Netflix nice. He got nominated for the Oscar. Unfortunately, that piece of shit Will Smith stole it from him. But that, <laughs> me going off on a tangent, or, or as I have to slap call that motherfucker. Ali, I'm just kidding. Muhammad Ali went in for 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 another punch. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, if you haven't seen that, it's awesome. Definitely check it out. Play along okay. at home, so and we'll be watching it. Movie. And uh, yeah, um, I'm excited. And so I guess from that, that's our next movie we're going to talk about next week. And then uh, now I'm going to just give a quick shout out. First of all, I'm going to give a shout out to Jose over at Watch Skip Plus. Check these guys out every week. They'll tell you exactly what films you need to see that are playing in the movie theaters. Not to mention, they'll give you an awesome plus part of the show where they'll talk about something new that they're, they're introduced to. So check out Watch Skip Plus. Uh, secondly, I'm going to go into my boy's Brad and Troy over at Not A Bomb. Uh, each week, Brad and Troy look at a film that was either a critical failure or a commercial failure, and they determine whether or not it is a bomb or not. So they're awesome. Um, and then, of course, Will and Sam, the Godfathers, over at The Gentleman's Guide to Midnight Cinema. Um, do you want to do a shout out, Mike, to any yeah. podcast that I miss? Because I'm sure I missed a couple. Uh, yeah, we'll go down the pod roll. Uh, there's the Raiders of the Podcast, my guys over there, Kevin and Craig and David and uh, my guy, Tyler, my favorite white trash loving Floridian. I love those guys. <laughs> Um, and it was kind of funny that they, they did a Ken Russell at the same time. I, I got to get my hands on whore. So that's the next thing I got to watch. So, I mean, uh, I mean, the oh, oh. <laughs> 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 come over to Jersey. I'll introduce you a few. Don't I'm worry. I won't, your, I won't mention anything to your wife. <laughs> but I got, I do got to see the movie horror, but thanks to the, <laughs> thanks to the guys over there at uh, Raiders of the podcast. Thanks to married with clickers. Thanks to the feminine critique. Thanks to um, cult of muscles. Any of that I have missed. We appreciate you. Uh, Jose pimp yourself out. Tell us about yourself before you go. Yeah, tell us, tell oh us yeah. Yeah. Like the plugs. Uh, so um, obviously my show watch get plus um, there's another show that I love listening to. It's called Wild Dream Podcast. Um, the So I think it's uh, Wild Dream Pod on Instagram, but it's Daniel and David. I believe they're in Colorado, but 
you want to you want to talk about high wire act what they basically do is they go see the movie and then they return home and immediately start recording. So when they say oh. it's a fresh take, it is a fresh take. Wow. Um, and th- those guys are very funny and hysterical. They had, they made a short, like a sort of like action uh, parody riff riff on eighties uh, action films. And they are working on a new short, which they may actually be uh, sending out to festivals. So Daniel and David, and then, um, Taylor, who uh, helps them with the social media and sometimes guests as well. Uh, I love Wild Dream. So if you guys can give that a look, a listen, that'd be great. And then the Backlook Cinema with Zoe is uh, is a lot of fun. So Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Very, very cool. And now are you going to be doing any of the, I, I know Troy and Brad, I think we're talking about, or I'm assuming you're going to be in the next Not A Bomb Classic, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so I that, your pick, the right? next one, Yep, the next one coming up is my pick. It's Fritz Long's uh, M, which is uh, pretty fantastic. Yeah, I've seen Metropolis, and I've seen a couple of his other films, and I've never seen M, so I have to check that one out. I have to look for it for sure. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Jose, for coming on. Like I said, I know our I, I fumbled a little bit. That's just part of my, who I am. Uh, we appreciate you being here, dude. You were awesome, and it was thank such you. a great time. Number one, being introduced to you for the first time because I've been friends with you on Facebook for a little while now. But just getting a chance <laughs> to talk, and then of course talk about this amazing little film. It was just an amazing time. So yeah, with all that good said, episode. Guys, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to seeing you next weekend. Um, just a one quick more thing, guys. Remember, go on our Facebook page. Uh, make sure you like it. Join the YouTube channel. Watch the videos here. Make sure you like. Leave comments. If you have feedback, if you're like, John, that was the worst fucking film in the world. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. (laughs) Write write in and tell us that. But tell us why. If you love the film, tell us why. If you have a recommendation, let us know, guys. We want to hear it. We're open to discovering new films. Part Part of the journey of this is discovering new material to cover, new and interesting films. So with all that said, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and a great week. Take care, guys. Thanks for everything.